Taxonomy. It's the science of classifying living things. That sounds exciting. Today, we'll basically be learning the Dewey Decimal System of Evolution. It's like filing. You must be on the edge of your seat. Okay, shut up. When it comes down to it, this science doesn't just categorize organisms. When you look a little deeper, you realize it's telling the story of all life on Earth. And it's a pretty good story. <laughs> Every living thing on this planet is related to every other living thing. If you go far enough back, we all have a common ancestor. An organism that both you and I are descended from, or something that a starfish and a blue whale are both descended from, or even weirder, that an oak tree and a salmon are both descended from. That organism lived. It lived very long ago, but it was here. And I dig that. The trick of taxonomy is basically figuring out where all those branches of the evolutionary tree are and finding some convenient labels to help us understand all of these remarkable interrelationships. Let's be clear though, taxonomy isn't about describing life in all of its ridiculous detail. It's mostly about helping humans understand it because it's way too complicated without structure. To get that structure, biologists use the taxonomic system to classify all the organisms on the earth it's sometimes called the phylogenetic tree, or the tree of life, and it illustrates the evolutionary relationships between all living species. So there are about two million known species, but there could be anywhere from five million to a hundred million species. Scientists really have no freaking idea. New species keep getting discovered all the time, and the more organisms we have to keep track of, the more complex the phylogenetic tree becomes. So there's not always a consensus about how to classify this stuff. There's a lot of gray area in the natural world. Actually, let me rephrase that. The natural world is one giant gray area. Sometimes it's just hard to know where to put a certain group of organisms, and eventually the group gets so big the classification system has to be messed with to make room for it. So the system isn't perfect, but it's good enough. Although taxonomy has come a long way since Linnaeus, we still use a bunch of the conventions that he invented. For instance, we still arrange things into taxa, or groups of organisms, and we still use the same taxa as Linnaeus. Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. We also still use Linnaeus' convention of binomial nomenclature, using a unique two-part name for every species, the genus and its species name, in Latin or sort of Latin-ish. This practice actually started back in the Middle Ages, when educated people were expected to know Latin. We know a lot less Latin now, but we know a lot more about evolution, which Linnaeus didn't. And we have technologies like genetic testing to classify relationships between organisms, and yet, we still use Linnaeus's morphology-based system because genetic evidence generally agrees with classifications that are made based on structure and form. However, because there was a lot of life that Linnaeus had no idea about, we had to stick a new taxa above Linnaeus's kingdom. We call it domain, and it's as broad as you can get. The domains are bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. The bacteria and the archaea are prokaryotes, meaning that their genetic material goes commando, with no nucleus to enclose it, while the eukarya make up all of the life forms with a nucleus, and include pretty much all of the life that you think of as life, and quite a lot of the life that you don't think about at all. It might seem like since all macroscopic life only gets one domain, it's kind of silly to give prokaryotes two. And for a long time we didn't. We didn't divide them up into different domains, they hung out together in a single domain called Monera. But it later became clear that bacteria, which live pretty much everywhere on Earth, including inside of you and deep in the Earth's crust, and archaea, which are even more hardy than bacteria, have distinct evolutionary histories. Archaea being more closely related to eukaryotes, and yes, thus me and you, they have totally different cell membranes, and the enzymes that they use to make RNA, their RNA polymerase, is much more like ours. Under the domain eukarya, which is by far the most interesting and even occasionally adorable domain, we have kingdoms Protista, Fungi, Plantae, and Animalia. Now scientists have settled on these four, for now. But these are categories that are a human creation, but there are good reasons for that human creation. The unscientific truth is that we looked at life and divided it up based on what we saw. So we were like, well, protists are single-celled organisms, so they're very different from the rest of the domain. And plants get their energy from the sun, and fungi look and act very different from plants and animals, and, you know, we already know what animals are, so they have to get their own kingdom. And those scientists are 
sometimes loath to admit it, that system of just looking and dividing things up actually worked pretty well for us. Not perfectly, but pretty well. But there's a reason why this worked so well. Evolutionarily, there are actual categories. Each of these kingdoms is a huge branch in the tree of life. At each branch, an evolutionary change occurred that was so massively helpful that it spawned a vast diversity of descendants. Plants, or plantae, are the autotrophs of the domain Eukarya. Autotrophs meaning that they can feed themselves through photosynthesis, of course. They're cellulose-based cell walls and chloroplasts, giving them a distinct difference from all other multicellular life. There are two other sorts of trophs. There's the heterotrophs, which get their energy by eating other organisms, and the chemotrophs, which are weird and crazy and only show up in bacteria and archaea and they get their energy from chemicals. Now the kingdom Protista is weird because it contains both autotrophs and heterotrophs. Some protists can photosynthesize while others eat living things. Protists are basically a bunch of weird eukaryotic single-celled organisms that may or may not be evolutionarily related to each other. Scientists are still trying to figure it out. Some are plant-like, like algae, some are more animal-like, like amoebas, and some are fungus-like, like slime molds. Protists are one of those gray areas I was telling you about, so don't be surprised if by the time you're teaching this to your biology students, there are more than four kingdoms in Eukarya. Fungi, which are, you know, the funguses. They include mushrooms and smuts and puffballs and truffles and molds and yeasts. And they're pretty cool because they have cell walls like plants, but instead of being made of cellulose, they're made of another carbohydrate called chitin which is also what the beak of a giant squid is made of, or the exoskeleton of a beetle. Because fungi are heterotrophs, like animals, they have these sort of digestive enzymes that break down their food and get reabsorbed. But they can't move, so they don't require a stomach for digestion. They just grow on top of whatever it is they're digesting and digest it right where it is, which is super convenient. And finally, we have Kingdom Animalia which is the lovely kingdom that we find ourselves and 100% of adorable organisms in. Animals are multicellular, always. We are heterotrophic, so we spend a lot of time hunting down food because we can't make it ourselves. And almost all of us can move, at least during some stage of our life cycle. And most of us develop either two or three germ layers during embryonic development. Wait for it unless you're a sponge. So like I said, we use this taxonomic system to describe the common ancestry and evolutionary history of an organism. Looking at the phylogenetic tree, you can tell that humans are more closely related to mice than we are to fish, and more closely related to fish than we are to fruit flies. So how about we pick an organism and we follow it all the way through the taxa from kingdom to species just to see how it works. I know. Let's pick this kitty. Because I know she'd like it. Right, cat? So kitties have cells that have nuclei and membrane-surrounded organelles, and they're multicellular and heterotrophic and have three germ layers of cells when they're embryos, so they're in the kingdom Animalia. And they have a spinal cord running down their backs, protected by vertebra and discs in between them. And they have a tail that doesn't have a butthole at the end of it, like a worm, which I'm really glad about. <laughs> and that puts her in the phylum Chordata. Kitty clearly does not like this, so I'm going to put her down now. And the kitty lactates. Uh, it gives birth to young like a cow instead of laying eggs like a chicken. And they have fur and three special tiny bones in their ears that only mammals have. So they're in the class Mammalia. So she's more closely related to cow than to chicken. Good to know. And like a bunch of other placental mammals that eat meat like weasels, the mustelids, and dogs, the canines, kitties are in the order Carnivora. And they're in the cat family, Felidae, whose members have lithe bodies and roundish heads, and except for cheetahs, retractable claws. And they're littler than tigers and panthers, which puts them in the genus Felis. And then at the level of the species, the descriptions get pretty dang detailed, so let's just say that you know what a cat is, so the species name is Catus. And look at that! Felis Catus. 